My plan is sound, mathematically sound. It cannot fail. It's perfect. Three months from now, I will be worth $50,000. Independent for life. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's show, we're diving into goal setting. Everyone knows the stats. New Year's resolutions don't work. So we've brought in the guy who's already proven to millions that he can help you make it work. It's John Acuff. In our headlines, one big money manager is out with his predictions for 2024. Do we agree? You'll hear in a moment. Plus, we'll throw out the lifeline to a lucky stacker and... Then I'll share some, eh, some might call it delectable, but I personally prefer delightful trivia. And now two guys who can help you stop worrying and start moving on your 2024 goals. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. That's right, stackers. Hey, you made it. You found us. Sit back and relax because we're about to have an hour, as uh, Doug, you just said, of goal-setting fun. I am Joe Saul C. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me, the guy bringing it three days a week in the brand new year. How are you, OG? Uh, Fantastic. I keep on swallowing my tongue, though, so I've got a a little something down there. Airball or something. How does that happen? You and Mama Cass. How how does that happen? How does that, that, I have no idea. How does a grown man swallow his tongue at like uh, 10 o'clock in the morning? I don't know. It's all raspy. So we'll see how the, see how the rest of the Wednesday goes. Are you finding yourself more streamlined in the last few hours? You cutting through the wind a little bit better than you used to? You got a very sexy haircut. New year, new me. Yes, it indeed. Is. It's fantastic. Tell us how new and how new you, what, what should we expect from OG in the new year? Oh, a little lighter, but uh, wow. same. You know, in today's world, it seems like the best treatment's reserved only for a few. Well, Discover wants to change that by making everyone feel special. That's why with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 live customer service as well as $0 fraud liability, which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Finally, no matter who you are or where you are in life, you'll feel special with Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. Wait, are you, are you guys even paying attention to anything I'm talking about? This is about me, guys. This is about new year, new me. All right, I'll start over. Yes, please do. Hey, stackers, a lot of people upset about Mint shutting down, and I get it. Uh, you spend time linking all your accounts, creating different budgets, but Rocket Money is one I can recommend. They make it easy to get set up. Now they recommend custom budgets based on your past spending. They manage your finances and save you money so you can actually reach your financial goals. Rocket Money's personal finance app. Not only do they do what Mint did, manage all your spending in one place, create budgets and monitor your credit score, but they also cancel unwanted subscriptions and negotiate bills for you to actually help you save money. It's a one-stop shop. You can see all your subscriptions in one place. And if I see something I don't want, Rocket Money can cancel it with a couple taps on the app. It's super easy. They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple months of wasted money and can negotiate lower bills for you, sometimes by up to 20%. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash SB. That's rocketmoney.com slash SB. Rocketmoney.com slash SB. Dude, that was fascinating. I just said, Doug, weren't you fascinated? I'm still speechless. It's incredible. We've got the John Acuff started his career with the Ramsey organization, has written tons of best selling books. He's coming down to mom's basement to teach you a better way to talk about goals. But before this, we have a headline. So. Let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from thinkadvisor.com. Jeffrey Gundelach 
the big time money manager out with his predictions, OG for 2024. Thought we'd walk through them, see what uh, the Jeffrey is thinking about the market. He always has some interesting takes. His uh, number one is that money market asset trends are bullish for high quality bonds. He says, because of high yields, assets have flooded into money market funds this year. And many think that that situation, it makes things bullish for risk assets like stocks, because all that money sitting on the sideline can come into the market. In fact, uh, while we were talking between recordings, OG, you were talking about the amount of money sitting on the sideline in cash. Well, the double line CEO sees it differently. He says, I think the spike in money market assets is bullish for bonds and for treasuries and other high quality bonds, because it's much more likely to go from a money market into, say, a five year type maturity treasury bond fund than it would be to go into some massively high P.E., crazy volatility type of thing like a stock. What do you think about that, that this might be saying more about this depressed bond market we had for a long time than it says about stocks? Doesn't he sell uh, bond funds? Isn't that his... Uh... Isn't that weird? Uh, angle of attack, yeah, as it were. Rule number one, stackers, always know how the person gets paid. So it's weird that number one on his list is, no, this is bonds are great, not those crazy high PEs in the stocks. The stocks. And the stocks. Got to put an S on it and call it the, like the Kmarts, yeah. the Fords. Yeah, going to, yeah. going to Walmarts. So yeah, I don't think that that's true at all, but what do I know? I'm not a billionaire that manages billions of dollars for well, a bond fund who really wants bond funds to go up. But that's interesting, OG, because I think he is right. I think there is a higher correlation to money and treasuries and the depressed bond market. And it makes sense. My take on this though, is who cares? Like, even if it says that things might be better for bonds, bonds are horrible for your long-term goals. We have a YouTube video out that's a clip of you saying stuff about how crappy it is to be in treasuries if you have a long-term goal. And a bunch of, we'll call them uh, uber nerds, are commenting about the fact that we don't specifically say the, the yield, like whether it's, you say zero and it's like 0. 0.5, right? 0. 0.5 isn't going to get you to your long-term goal. Zero isn't going to get you to your long-term goal. And it's funny how some of these nerds can get so lost in the weeds of the little minutia about, hey, we're talking about how much bonds suck for long-term goals, that they forget about the fact that bonds suck for long-term goals. Well, I mean- Like, does it matter? I actually think he's right, though. I think he's right. You think that money is going to go from money markets into fixed income? No chance. I do. No way. I do. Nope. That's not what happens. Generally speaking- People are in cash, not because they have magically had this opportunity to save boatloads of cash, but because they made really terrible investment decisions from a market timing standpoint and take money from stocks and put it into a money market. Now, I'm excluding, when I say money market, I'm not counting emergency fund, you know, high yield savings accounts where you're actually supposed to have that. I'm talking about en masse the average investor, which maybe not the people listening to this are. So if you're listening and going, well, that's not me. I didn't do that. Well, good. Yeah, you're, you're one of the smart ones. But the statistics tell us that people do this a lot. They move a bunch of money into cash and then they move a bunch of money back into fixed income. You know, at the end of December, uh, the market had a, well, I mean, basically from November through December, the market had a really great run to kind of finish out 2023. I read an article right before the holidays, right before Christmas that Something like twenty billion dollars was moved into the S and P five hundred, you know, after it had gone up seventeen percent in six weeks or something like that. That's behavior of really bad market timers, in in people who got their faces kicked in in twenty twenty two, took all their money out down twenty percent, and then went, "Yep, the economy is going to crash, the market's going to take a crap," and waited for it to happen, and it didn't happen. In fact. If it happened, it happened in 2022. And so they took their money out at the wrong time and then went, oh, crap, look at all these stocks that are going up. Look at all these indexes that are going up. I better get back in. And what happened? I sold it at a low price and bought it back at a high price, which is why just doing the thing every single month always beats that. Always, always, always. But I think your point is spot on, but it's also why bonds are going to win here. Because I think people do the wrong thing. I think with the election year coming up, the whole reason we made the upcoming election year episode back in November and all of our experts predicted people are going to do dumb crap in 2024 because of the election year. They're going to worry about the short-term stuff 
way too much. The flight to quality, I think, OG is, you know, they call it on CNBC, is going to continue. But high yield bonds aren't yielding as high anymore. High yield money markets are starting to fall with the rate. If I want to keep the quote flight to quality and I've got bond rates now rebounding, I got bonds rebounding, it's an easy move. It's an easy win for somebody who wants to stay in quality. It is a dumb place for a long-term investor to be, but I think investors are going to continue to be dumb, which is why I think Gondolatch is right in this case. Okay. I guess we'll see. We, I think we will. Number two, the federal deficit will reach crisis levels very soon, he says. The growing federal deficit, now already high at over 6% of gross domestic product, quote, is something that's coming barreling right at us. And I see newspaper articles all the time now, people talking about how this, what used to be something that we could worry about 50 years from now, is now more like 50 months from now, Gondolach said. The federal deficit as a percentage of gross domestic product rose by 9.4% on average. He noted, if that were to occur again, based on current GDP, the federal deficit could reach $5 trillion by 2028 or 20% of GDP, he cautioned. In the three years following all recessions dating to 1969, the federal deficit as a percentage of GDP climbed an average of 5.2 per year. So he thinks that coming out of a recessionary period, we're going to see the deficit go up a ton the next few years. You on board with that prediction? <clears throat> well, I mean, were we in a recession? I, I didn't, nobody told me. So, I mean, the first half of that is a little bit of an issue, but the Treasury Department is going to continue to print more money and we're going to continue to spend more than we have, which is an issue. Yeah. But I think the bigger thing that most people don't really put together is that for every dollar that we spend, we produce greater sums of economic output. So it's not a great thing. We would all like to have, you know, a bunch of balanced budgets and, you know, and no debt and all that sort of stuff. But as a company, you know, if you look at the country as a company, Apple has all the money in the universe. They've got debt. Berkshire Hathaway has all the money in the universe. They've got debt. Dave Ramsey would have a big issue with that because he's got a big thing about not having any debt at all. But smart CFOs will borrow money when they have an opportunity to and invest it into things that will produce greater output. What remains to be seen, of course, is whether or not that investment into the the broader, you know, US economy will actually produce greater output. It has, you know, over the last hundred years. Whether or not it continues to do that is another matter, I suppose. But um it's not great. But I'm not worried about it. No, but I'm not a bond fund manager. So but that's also, again, I think you make a great point there, which is that I'm worried about it. I certainly am worried about it. I don't know if he's right or wrong. I don't know. But let's say that he's right. What can I do about that? What can I personally do about that today? Besides vote, right? I can worry about the national debt. I mean, this is a number two thing on his list. Helps take us away from what's my job. Because I don't know about you, but is it still like this, OG? When I was a planner, and you know it's been a long time since I was a planner, people come into my office, and this is what they're worried about. And they want to spend the entire hour worried about the national debt. And I'm like, w w we got to talk about you saving for retirement. Like, we got to talk about the fact that you don't have any life insurance. Like, what are we doing here? No. Worried about the national debt when there's so many things that you can control, and this isn't one of them. That's what, so this does bother me, but I just like, what can I do? Is there anything I can do? I don't think so. Write your congressman. Yeah. Write your congresswoman. Right. Yeah. Vote. Or run for office. Yeah. Number three on his list, a recession could happen in the second quarter. Economic indicators are getting much more recessionary looking, Gunnelat said, pre predicting a recession could come in the 2024 second quarter. The yield curve for two and 10 year treasury bonds usually becomes inverted one or two years before recession starts, then de inverts typically at a recession's front edge. He noted, suggesting the market's near that point now. And then he goes into exactly uh, exactly why he thinks a recession is is underway. This point specifically to bond fund manager, right? Yeah. You know what you want to do, OG? You, you know how the stock market's hot right now and nobody's paying attention to bonds? We're going to have a recession in the second quarter. That's going to mean that you probably want more money in safe places. Well, and of course, putting money in fixed income is the opposite of a safe place, as evidenced by 2022 when the market was down 20% and bonds were also down 20%. So you didn't get any of the protection, air quotes, that you were supposed to get. And you certainly didn't get any of the rebound that came with staying the course. If you stayed in your stock investments from 2022 to 2023, you're even money. 
you're pretty much even money. You know, it's like it's like the last two years never happened. But that's not true with your fixed income uh, side of the portfolio. Let me put it this way. I think he's right that there's a recession coming. I don't know that he has the correct timing. Because the reality is, is that over the next 50 years, there's going to be a recession every five or seven or 10 years. There's going to be a 20% bear market. There's going to be a 10% correction. All these words that we use, there's a, those happen as frequently as storm systems. I mean, it's just, it's so imbecilic. Is that a word, Doug? Could you check my imbecilic? You're, I see a nod. That's approved. Gonna, the, the council will approve okay, that. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so let me go back to it then. I think it's so imbecilic. I wouldn't be able to spell it, to devise an investment strategy on panic and fear. I just, I just don't, this stuff is going to happen all the time from now until the end of time, as it has since the beginning of time. So why would you, why would you worry about when the next 20% market decline is going to happen and just go, I, 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 don't, I know it's going to happen. I just, it doesn't affect you from an investment perspective because you can't time it. Everybody and their brother said, oh, at the end of December of 2022, and the market's down 20%. Oh, that, there it is. That's the recession. That's the front edge of it. Here we go. Here, here, oh, we, here we go. Oh, March 23rd, 2020. Everybody said, ah, <laughs> down 30. Just wait. This is the beginning of all the nonsense that's going on. The smartest people in the universe work at the biggest companies in the world. And when something doesn't go their way, they, have a, they are self-motivated because all of their pay is tied to the stock value, right? When you're the CEO of Disney or CBS or Coca-Cola or whatever, you get, you know, I mean, they make good money, right? They, they make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, million bucks a year salary. They're making good money. But the big money is in the stock options. You don't see like Tim Cook makes a million dollar salary, $280 million of a bonus from Apple. Stock. Right. <laughs> he is Bam. directly motivated to make sure that that company does well. And as a byproduct of that, you have all of these CEOs, all of these really smart people whose singular focus is making that stock go up because it's, it benefits them directly. So just assume that when, you know, we hear this when it comes to, we're talking about the election. So somebody's going to win. That's a fact. We have no idea who, but someone will win. And that person, roughly half of the population will go, is an idiot. And the other half will go, thank God, roughly, give or take. It will be like 55-45 or 52-48, but it's roughly going to be about half yeah, and half, right? Ish. Ish. Yeah. <laughs> and there's going to be some policies or something that you're going to disagree with, whether it's the person you voted for or didn't. But I'll just give an example. When changes happen in the energy market, do does, does, does the CEOs of Exxon and BP and those guys they just go, well, I guess we just don't have oil anymore, huh? Fold up shop, everybody. <laughs> just close it up. Sell all the tankers. Get rid of all the oil. No, they go, hey, we got to pivot to natural gas. We have to invest in this wind energy. We have to do these other things to make money because my freaking pay depends on it. And I'm not going down. I got stuff to pay for. You know, I got a big house in the Hamptons. I want to build another 10,000 square feet on. So I need this freaking stock to go up. So they pivot. They figure out new ways. I don't know. Doug's trivia on Monday. You can't do uh, advertising for cigarettes anymore. How long have the cigarette companies been making money without advertising on TV? <laughs> they went, no advertising on TV. Well, I guess, guys, shut it down. Oh, no more smokes shoot. for anybody. No, <laughs> oh. please don't say that. It's going to be the end of us. <laughs> They're like, all right, fine. Let's get celebrity endorsers. Let's figure out a way to make it cool. K-O-O-L. I, I, here's the thing. All this stuff is going to happen. All these predictions, all of these smart people are going to come out and say, this is what's going to happen in 2024. This is what's going to happen. Da, da, da. Who cares? It doesn't affect your plan. What's going to happen in the next 12 months or 18 months or five years really isn't going to affect your retirement. He's, he's like, did Joe, did you pull the string in, in OG's back and then just let the talking happen? He's like one of those dolls where you just like, Zoom. that was fabulous. It was wow. absolutely, that's the best radio we've had so far in 2024. By far. Can it get better than that? I submit that it cannot. Uh, I don't know. What happened? I blacked out for a second. <laughs> oh, it was great. He was at another level of consciousness. Some good radio. Maslow, I was at like number 10 on Maslow's list of self-actualization. <laughs> <laughs> we will dive into the rest of Mr. Gundelach's uh, predictions. I do think uh, 
I like these OGs. You say, who cares? It doesn't affect your plan. I like looking at these, each of these and goes, if he's right, how does that affect my plan? If it's wrong, how does it affect my plan? So no matter what happens, it's in my investment policy statement, right? I've got, okay, okay, is this covered my investment policy statement? No matter what happens here, am I covered? Then I know I have a good investment policy statement versus, but you're right. I don't want to throw a dart and bet all my money on, uh, we're going into recession in the second quarter where I pull my money out on October or excuse me, March 31st. So good stuff. Uh, I have a question for you about investment policies. What's up? And I don't remember the last time we gave us, we talk about it all the time and it sounds like something that's critical. Do you have an example of what one sounds like or looks like? Is it a four page document? Is it a three sentence statement? That's a great question. It's a document that generally is a page or less. Does not, I mean, if you want to write out all your whys, it's great. My investment policy is that based on this goal, I want my diversification to be 50% this, 30% this, 20% this. That's number one. My policy is to stay there. My next policy is if I deviate 5% off of that, then I will rebalance to get back to those exact numbers. But until then, I'm going to let it run. That's second investment policy. Third investment policy is if the stock market drops more than 15%, I can feel free to then rebalance sooner so that I get back to the goal. I'm only going to change those target numbers every other year as I get closer to the goal, not because of the market, but because I'm closer to that goal. So those are the types of things that we're looking at. And when I know that I'm going to rebalance once a year, unless it goes more than 5%, Unless the market goes down X percent, which I'm going to give myself permission, I'm not going to change that mix. Much more likely to hold the course. I'm not going to play all these dumb games. So when we used to set up metrics and dashboards for large organizations within companies, we would set up, here's what we're going to measure. Here's what our upper and lower parameters are going to be for each of those measurements. I heard you say that. And then here's how we're going to change it. Here's our allowable changes once we once the trigger happens that says we got to change something. I think I heard you say those three things. There it is. About building it. Probably another episode. I'm really interested in this. Like, how do we decide what that diversification is? How do we set our upper and lower parameters? Maybe we think about that as a topic in a future episode. Absolutely. No, let's cover that. I think that's an important place to go because we definitely don't want people hanging here. We'll also have Kevin in our show notes linked to a few episodes where we've touched on that topic because we have talked about asset allocation, about the efficient frontier before. We've also had guests that have covered that. So, but you're right, dusting that off and going over it again. Good stuff. But between now and then, we'll do two things. Number one, have links to some of those episodes in the show notes. And then number two, Kevin Bailey, who does a brilliant job with our 201 newsletter every Tuesday and Thursday. He'll dive into this more in the 201s with some curated links so you can go deeper in the meantime. Coming up next, John Acuff. I love saying that name. I mean, not because it's a phenomenal name, just he's a hell of a dude. Uh, This is John's third trip down to mom's basement. And every time it's just brilliant. I'm so glad that he mentors our stackers as much as he has, because the stuff that he brings is what we're all thinking about. You know, we're thinking about right now. We're thinking about New Year's resolutions and we know New Year's resolutions are frustrating and we often think big and we get all weirded out because we don't know what we really want. And it's so scary to think about what you really want. Like, I don't, I don't know what I want for breakfast tomorrow. Like, how am I supposed to think about what I want 10 years from now? Really? He's going to talk about a great method to do that. So buckle up everybody, because before that, while John's getting situated, let's uh, have some trivia from Doug. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And as you know, I love pizza as much as the next guy, but not as much as the guy who may have overpaid for his slices back on today's date in 2009. A man named Laszlo Hanyech paid 10,000 Bitcoin for how many pizzas? I'll be back right after I pick the pineapple off this slice. Oh, gee, ruins every pizza. Whenever he orders that Canadian pineapple ham crap. And now word from our sponsors at Betterment. High advisory fees, not chill. The stress of day trading, so not chill. 
pacing back and forth, checking the market every day like somebody in an action movie waiting for the president to call. Totally and completely not chill. But you know what is totally chill? Betterment, the automated investing app that puts your money to work for you. Their wide range of diversified ETFs, including stocks and bonds, make it easy and simple to help you get in the market and stay in the market without being glued to your phone. With Betterment's tech smart tools, portfolio optimization, and automatic rebalancing, all the hard work of investing is done for you. So you can be the totally chill investor you've always wanted to be. Betterment, the automated investing app that helps make it easy to be invested. Visit Betterment.com to learn more and to get started. Investing involves risk. Performance is not guaranteed. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany, the budget nista can help. When it comes to financial stuff, gather friends, confidants as you go along who are on the same path as you because family is amazing, but family doesn't always understand the journey that we're on because they have their separate journeys. So I just feel like the more voices you have, whether it's ours from listening to the podcast, we can be like your big sister friends. Brown Ambition, wherever you listen. Hey there, stackers. I'm Pizza Lover and your deep dish of trivia. Ooh, that's a good one. I like that. Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Today's question on this date back in 2009, Laszlo Hanyech wanted some pizza. So he called Papa John's and ordered some, paying with 10,000 Bitcoin. The question, how much pizza did he get for that 10,000 Bitcoin? Your answer, two. That means, given the cost of Bitcoin as I wrote this, which was roughly $41,500, he may be slightly overpaid for those two pies by giving Papa John's $415 million. I hope they were good. Speaking of good, nah, he's great at helping you find goals that work. Here's John Acuff. Super happy he's visiting us back in mom's basement. Friend of the show, John Acuff, joins us again. How are you, man? Yeah, thanks for having me back again. I appreciate that. Well, happy new year to you. What happens at the Acuff family household over New Year's? Uh, we're not that crazy. Like, I feel like every movie makes it seem like New Year's <laughs> Eve is like this amazing party you're not invited to. So it's pretty <laughs> chill. This year, um, we went to, we, I, one of the rules I live my life by is always know at least one Cajun. I think everybody should have a Cajun friend. Great rule of thumb. Cause yeah. I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah. And so we went to a Cajun friend's house who put on a huge soiree and Cajuns are always like, there's crabs, there's a boil of some kind. So we did a Cajun, your traditional Cajun New Year Eve, obviously. Fabulous. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I am dressed in my alma mater t-shirt just for you. Go Michigan State Spartans. Ah, look at you. Look at you. Well, because your story, John, starts with a recent trip you had to uh, your alma mater, right? You did, yeah. did. I can't believe, like, I was just at Michigan State a few weeks ago. I loved it. You didn't have that similar experience. No, that was not my experience. My experience was the opposite of that. We were there to tour my oldest daughter at the school my wife and I both went to. And she said, wasn't college amazing? And I said, no, it was a train wreck. I was looking back on four years of just knucklehead decisions, put on social suspension for a year for a Halloween prank, bad What grades. does social suspension mean? Well, so it means you get to meet with the dean, the dean oh, good. of uh, That's student good. activities. Yeah, he's no longer there. And he was fine. I thought he was very scary at the time as a freshman. So it just means it's almost like a, hey, it's like the first two strikes, you know, in a three strike program, they just go ahead and give you the first two. And then you're on like, <laughs> Hey, I better never visit this office again. That's what social suspension <laughs> means. Like, I don't want to see you again. Fair enough, sir. Fair enough. You had some crazy jobs too. Yeah. I, I mean, I worked at a shaved ice stand out in front of Walmart freshman year. I worked for like a day at a shoe store. I was just bouncing all around college. And so I came back home and was like, why didn't I live up to my potential? And instead of kind of sitting in the regret of that, I thought, what can I do going forward? And that's where this book kind of kicked off with, I'm not living up to my potential. What can I do about that? And then are other people feeling the same way? And so we did a study with 3000 people and 96% of people said they weren't living up to their potential. So then it was enough for us to go, wow, I should spend some time really digging into this. What does it mean to live up to your full potential? We just got through Christmas. You had a great Christmas analogy on this. 
Yeah, it's essentially, well, there were two stats, the 96%. And then the second stat, dude, was 50% of people said uh, they were only leaving 50% of themselves in the game. They were leaving 50% of themselves on the table. And so I related it to be like walking down the stairs every Christmas morning, only opening half your Christmas presents. Like that would make for a really sad Christmas if people were going, hey, those are yours over there. Those are your presents too. And you're like, no, I'm not gonna. And that's what most people are walking around with. So that was the kind of, the start to the whole conversation. Well, it's a great time to talk about this. January 3rd, obviously everybody is, what, what a new year, new you, TM, John. Oh yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, all it takes is you drink the right amount of water. You'll be a completely <laughs> different person. <laughs> Change, changes yeah. everything. Change your whole life. But so what do we start with? You know, back in the 90s, there's a book that I like a lot, Stephen Covey, right? Seven oh, yeah. Habits, Highly Effective People, says begin with the end in mind. Yeah. And you walk that walk. And I think a lot of people end up where you end up with that, where it's it's so hard. Yeah, there's a lot of intimidation. So I think over the years, what's happened with that idea is that we've turned it into until I know the end, I can't begin. So I meet countless people that go, as soon as I figure out my life, then I'll start changing it. I need a life plan. I need a life mission. I need to know my why. You know, another great book, uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek, we've misinterpreted that into until I know my why, I can't try. And so I've had friends spend six months trying to figure themselves out. Meanwhile, not changing anything. I call that the vision wall. When you walk, run into this big wall of vision that you have to figure out before you get started. And I'd much rather you take some small steps to begin. I'd much rather you not try to go, here's what the next 10 years are going to look like. Whenever somebody tells me their 10-year plan, I think that is adorable. Because I guarantee COVID wasn't in it. Like I guarantee if you made a 10-year plan in 2018, you weren't like, and then three years right in the middle, the world gets shut down. And then after that, so I think that that's part of the pressure we put on ourselves, especially in motivational circles is, oh yeah, I knew exactly where I was headed. I didn't know that 10 years ago. I, I had no idea I would be writing books or doing what I'm doing now. And so I think once you kind of settle into that, it gives you the ability to plan some small things and actually take some small steps that build some momentum. So you have this, you know, I think, okay, so I, I'm not looking forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to look forward. You're like, the biggest thing I can think about is my Jeep, right? Yeah. Or about the fact that I want a Jeep. In fact, it turns out you didn't even want a Jeep. No, no. I ended up getting a VW GTI, which is like the opposite of a Jeep. It's a hatchback. It's a hot hatch, as they say in the biz. Is that and the biz so, talk? Is that what they say? Well, the street racers that I hang out with, we when I when we're uh, Tokyo drifting. I think of street racers, I think John Acuff. Yeah, like, yeah just... totally. Yeah, I look like, I definitely don't look like a suburban dad. No, not oh. at all. I look like a cool street racer. That's what people say about me. They're like, man, that he's hip. They don't even use hip. That's too bad. That's too bad. It is too bad. Hip's a good word. I say dude way more than the average person. But no, so I realized, okay, I can't look forward. I feel stuck in the present. So I started to do something that everybody says you shouldn't do, which is I looked backwards. And I started to say, what are the moments that have lit me up? Like, what are the things that have really encouraged me, that have really made me feel alive, big to small to medium? So all I did was I created what I call the best moments list. I wrote the phrase best moments on a piece of paper in the Augusta, Georgia airport, and I started to list out things. And Before we get to those things, John, what even made you decide to look backward? Because that just seemed, when I read that, that just seemed totally counterintuitive. Like, oh, why yeah, everybody I... says, don't look back. You're not going that way. Right. It's, I think that's bad advice. I think the problem is we don't learn from who we are and then we try to create a new person versus going, okay, wait a second. I could try to dream about the next 20 years, which is really overwhelming, really intimidating. Or I could look at the last 10 years, the last five years, last two years and go, what were the moments that made me feel alive? And that, that's history. One is fantasy and requires tremendous imagination, tremendous grit. One is just you taking notes on things that have already happened. And so part of the reason I looked back was it was easier. It felt possible. It felt encouraging. I like to try things that are counterintuitive. In this book, Finish, I talked about cutting your goals in half because everybody goes, if your goal doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. And I was like, I don't know. That sounds good on a mug. I don't see that working in real life. The people I know that have done big things started in small ways. So that was part of it was I wanted to take a counterintuitive approach to it to see if it worked. And if it didn't, I wouldn't be talking about it on this podcast. But what happened was my list of a few things turned into 171 items over a couple of weeks. And I felt grateful. Like it taught me gratefulness. It taught me self-awareness. I was able to go, oh, these are the things I care about. Um, it helped me be present. If you ask your head and your heart to look for great things from your past, they automatically start looking for them in your present. So you start having this running list of like, oh, that's a best moment. 
And then I tested it with hundreds of people because that's always my process is like, I try something in my life. Does it work? If it works, I go, I wonder if it would help other people. So I go, do other people need it? So I do the studies with this PhD, Mike Peasley, who helps me. And then if other people need it, I'm like, all right. And then I test it with hundreds of real people. And then if it works, I put it in a book. And so for me, that was, I was marching through the process step by step by step. And at each level, I'd ask people to do 30 moments and they do 150, they do 300. And I started to see people go, oh, this actually showed me things I didn't know about myself. So then I was like, okay, it's worth, adding to a book, it's worth teaching for years and years and years. Cause that's what happens when you write a book, you talk about it for years. Give me an idea of some of the things that appeared on your list. Yeah. So, um, there were some serious ones. There were some silly ones. So an obvious one would be like, Oh, hitting the New York times bestsellers list. That was a best moment. A smaller one would be seeing the headlights in my driveway when my teenage daughters drive home from an event. Cause it means they made it back safely. And that moment was like one of those parent moments, like, oh, they're here. That's great. It can be small things like I love getting a new notebook. I'm a big notebook guy. So like when I get a new notebook and I it's day one and I unwrap it and I go to page one, like that's a best moment for me. It can be, you know, favorite music. It can be a song that you stay in the driveway for. You came home and you're not getting out of your car until The Boys of Summer by Don Henley's off. The big thing is you give yourself permission to put anything you want on the list. And so other people that that did this test with me would say, like, I remember one woman said, a best moment for me happened today. I was watching my son get off the school bus and he walked out and then he rerouted his entire walk home to jump through a puddle. He went out of his way to jump through a puddle. And that was this unexpected little boy moment of joy. And she was like, that was the best moment I got to see that. And so it doesn't have to be massive, but again, it turns on your radar for it. She might have missed that if she wasn't in that moment. And so what happens is you create this list and then the coolest switch happens where all of a sudden you go, I want more of that. Every single person that does this, when you make this list, you automatically go, oh, I want more of that in my life. And then you start to go, how can I make those things intentional, not accidental? Because a lot of them happen by accident. So now you get this really sneaky life plan. So you go, you're not trying with a blank piece of paper to go, what are the things you go, man? What's my legacy? Yeah, what's my legacy is one of those words. It's so comical to me because no offense in 200 years, no one will be talking about you. Like I always say, name the president from 1898 or name the richest person from 1912. Nobody goes, oh yeah. Or tell me what job your great, great grandfather did. You're like, I don't, I don't even know his name. You have this circle of people and maybe the next circle of people, that's who you're supposed to love and serve and pour into. But the legacy thing is, I think, just a funny way to be like, I remember Eddie Murphy, they were were kind of picking on him in a Rolling Stone article and like, you've made some bad movies, like they're picking on him about the clumps and whatever those movies were. And he was like, yeah, no offense. No one's going to be talking about my best movies in 400 years. Like, no offense. Like, no one's going to be like, remember uh, coming to America? They're not (laughs) going to be. So yeah, so it gives you this life plan that you actually get to build your life based on the things that you really care about and you don't have to guess at them. I want to back up, John, though, to a word you said earlier, because I think that some of those moments that you put on the list, those little moments, which, you know, we talk about this, this last year, 2023, I think I did more interviews with experts on burnout. It just seemed to be huh. what the publishers were interested in, right? Like our our life is faster. We're trying to be bigger. Social media is telling us we got to do more. We just talked about the joke around legacy. And when you talk to me about the mud puddle moment, that is use the word gratitude, the gratitude around a simple walk mm-hmm. or splashing the mud puddle like you're eight years old. Like I feel like it's those little moments where the gratitude lives. Yeah, and- I'd heard people talk about it forever, that gratitude is important, but I didn't know how to practice it. I'm a practical, tactical kind of guy. I don't like when people go, you should have an abundance mindset. I'm like, yeah, agreed, but how? And this was one of those exercises that helped me remember things I had forgotten. And again, it turned on my vision for the things that I was missing. And it becomes a game. It becomes a little game where you can't wait to add some stuff to your list. And so I, I think as far, like for me, it's interesting you're talking about burnout. The thing I think about burnout is I would say the majority of the people I know that experience it, it's usually they're not burned out from working too hard on things they care about or working too hard in their passion or working too hard on their purpose. Usually it's they don't have a purpose. They have unhealthy boredom. They are not connected to their life mission. Like I know a lot of dudes. I can't speak to women about this because I'm, you know, just the men I work with. 
they're burned out because they don't have a purpose. And it's not that they're overworking, they're underworking, if anything. Like, it's not that they're going, man, I got a mission and I'm giving it my all and I love it and I feel alive and I'm doing too much. They'll go, I really need to get some rest. And I'll go, from what? You're not doing much right. Like, what are you resting from? I think there's this general sense of like, I don't even know if burnout is the right word because burnout is you burn so brightly, you burned out. The people I see that feel stuck, it's not that they burn so brightly, they eventually burned out. It's often they haven't had the match lit in a long time and they feel the sadness of that and the weight of that. That's what I see. I'm spinning my wheels on stuff I don't really care about. Yeah. And you're just like, I haven't, or just think about our world. Our world is not designed for you to succeed. Our world is designed for you to shop. You have to recognize that it's not designed for you to succeed. It's designed for you to shop right now. There are a hundred thousand of the smartest developers, psychiatrists, doctors, programmers, advertisers, all with one goal for your time. That is their goal. Goals are hard because Netflix is easy. Goals are hard because Instagram is easy. Netflix doesn't want you to get in shape. It doesn't want you to live out of your purpose. It wants you to binge their next show. And it should. That's their business model. Even dating sites don't want you to get married. Dating sites want you to have 100 meaningless hookups because that continues the business model. If you fall deeply and madly in love and delete the app, that's a failure. They actually lose money. So I think right now what people are experiencing is that more so than ever before in history, you're seen as an ATM machine. You are a tired, exhausted ATM machine. And there are smart people that recognize that and are doing everything they can to keep you in that position. What I love about going backwards too, before we move on to some of the prompts that you have, I want to go through a few of these for our stackers, if you don't mind, John. Before we get there, when I've looked at the biggest problems that I've had in my life, I often look externally, right? I look outside. I look at what is what can the world give me? What can I do for the world? This look backwards feels like the best advice I ever get, which is always it's inside you. Mm-hmm. What you're seeking more of is already there. You don't got to you know create the pyramids. Mm-hmm. It's already right there inside you. And it looks like looking back at this moment takes you back to this thing that's existed forever. Yeah. And you often you have plenty of it. You just haven't seen it. Or one of the dangerous things is when you say, when this happens, then I'll feel happy. Or like perfectionists like to say, when this is done, then I can rest. They give themselves conditions to rest versus just going, I need to rest. And what happens is often when they get to that level, they just move the goalposts anyway. When I have this amount of money, then I'll feel at peace. And then you get that amount of money and you move the goalposts, you move the goalposts. And so I think that's some of it is that idea. And then also like the internal versus the external I control my actions. I don't control the outcomes. Like I say that to people all the time. I'm the CEO of my actions. I'm not the CEO of my outcomes. I'm really not. So I can do the best I can with a book. I don't control it going viral. I really don't. There's not a, whenever somebody goes, oh, that person had a system. Well, then why doesn't everybody use a system? I I heard that over and over in Nashville. People go, oh, well, Taylor Swift has a system to her success. Oh, then some other people should use that system. If it's just a system, they re- should do. I'd recommend a lot of people use that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you go, no, it's not a system. It's a million things. A lot of them outside of her control, a lot of them inside of her control. So I think that's part of it too, is that we sometimes obsess about the external stuff versus doing the internal, which you actually have a lot of control over. You have a couple of prompts. I like the fact that this is this project, John, is much it feels like a workbook. Yeah. Like we're mm. going to work through this together. Chapter one, chapter two leads into chapter three, chapter four. We're going to do this. You actually have a funny thing at the beginning of, of the second chapter where you're like, hey, so you like that stuff we did in the first chapter? Let's get started. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's actually do it. You've got some prompts. I want to ask just about a couple of these. One of your prompts is time speeds up or slows down when I dot, dot, dot. What are we going for there? Yeah. So there's scientific research around your brain experiences time differently when you're engaged in activities, depending on like the flow state stuff. I think it's probably related to that. I mean, whether it's flow or being in the zone or dialed in people, when you describe this can automatically go, Oh yeah. Like when I'm writing, I look up and it's been an hour or when I'm knitting or when I'm talking with a friend, we've all had a moment. And so the goal of the prompts was to say, okay, let's make it easy to come up with these. If we are having a conversation at coffee, I'd probably give you five or six things and go, what about this? Have you thought about this? And so the time was, okay, it speeds up or it slows down because everybody's had that experience. I wanted to create some universal prompts that were easy for people to go, oh yeah, I have had that experience. That is what happened to me. 
That second prompt is the best job I ever had was blank. And the reason I liked it so much was because blank. Yeah. So part of that is, again, finding the best parts of things that you might not even remember as having best parts. Because if you really sit with somebody and they go, I didn't even like that job and go, you went eight hours for zero, eight hours every day for 50 weeks. They go, no, there was this one project I did, or no, there was this one person I connected with. And so some of that is going back and finding the diamonds that might be hidden in plain sight. And then, so what happens there is you go like one of mine and silly, but I love that at auto trader, we had a weekly standing meeting with the executives, which meant my week had shape. I love when my week had shape where it meant I better have my projects ready for Wednesday because I had an hour with the top level people to show them the stuff. And that gave the rest of my week shape. And I liked being prepared for that. And that taught me a lesson for later on in life. Now I run my own business. There's technically no executive coming to do that review. How do I pattern what I'm doing now knowing that information. The thing about the list is that it gives you self-awareness. You can't change your life if you don't have self-awareness. And I, the examples I give are like the executive who gets fired for anger issues thought he was passionate. He was like, what are you taught? No, I'm a loud passion. They're like, no, that was abusive. No self-awareness. The person who dates 10 losers in a row never stops and goes, huh, what's the one thing in common in all these dating? Oh, it was me. Why do I keep accepting losers? Why do I keep thinking that's a healthy thing? So once you have self-awareness, it's kind of like those video clips you see online where a baby gets cochlear implants and they hear their mom's voice or the people get the color glasses and they can see finally. It's like you start to notice things. And again, you bring them forward. The whole point of the exercise isn't, wow, I remembered some good things I like. The whole point is bring those forward, put those in your present, put those in your future. I want to go over just one last piece to get our stackers started on this and then the book is out now for people that want it, but you categorize these into four areas. Yep. Really, you can take this big, long list that people, lights people up, as you mentioned. People get excited. They put way more stuff on these than you ever thought would happen. What are the four areas and why does categorizing these in, into four make sense? What, what are we doing with it? I really studied the list to say, okay, 171 is, is so many. Are there patterns here? I'm always, I'm always looking for frameworks that make it easy for me to understand the information and to do something with it. So I started to study my list, other people's lists, and every moment fit into one of four types. The way I describe it, it was like looking at one of those 3D posters where an image comes out of it if you look at it long enough. And the moments were an experience moment, an accomplishment moment, a relationship moment, or an object moment. An experience moment would be if you went on a hike, you went on a beautiful hike by yourself and just enjoyed it. That's an experience. A relationship moment is if you went on the hike with a friend who was going through a divorce and you poured into them and that's why it mattered. The relationship moment was on that list because of the person. So I go to dinner with a group of friends. We went last night. Sometimes like I think if I went to that same restaurant without them, would it be a best moment? It wouldn't. I'd be sitting there eating alone. Like It's the people that make it the best. So that's a relationship moment. An accomplishment moment is something you did, some sort of effort led to it being a best moment. So if you went on a hike and you hiked it faster than you'd ever hiked it because you wear a Garmin watch and you tracked your time, that's an accomplishment moment. And the last one is an object. If you went on the hike and you grabbed the pine cone to remind yourself of that moment, that's an object. And so what I encourage people to do is to start to label their list. And the reason it's important is, again, it's another layer of self-awareness because what happens is all of a sudden you go, wow. I'm 80% accomplishment. And I didn't even know that. I really like accomplishments, but I grew up in a family where accomplishments were kind of frowned on. Don't be too big for your britches. So I've been pulling back. Well, maybe I'm made for that. I need to lean into that. Or you go, wow, I'm 60% relationship. And I felt really isolated because of three years of COVID. No wonder I feel in a funk. Like my right. entire backstory is relationship, relationship, relationship. I'm not pursuing them right now. No wonder. And then the fun one was like everyone's list. Every single person, their smallest item uh, list was objects. They didn't care about objects. Objects was never the number one for anyone. Kind of reiterates what we talk about in finance, right? That it's not about the stuff. No, it doesn't matter. And what's funny about that is every bit of marketing is stuff, 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 stuff. But every bit of when somebody's heart and head got to write what they care about, stuff was pretty small. And, and even if they had stuff on it, it was often tied to a person. It was tied to a person or like an accomplishment. So they'd go, this Porsche reflects that I told myself 15 years ago when I got into real estate, someday I'm going to have a 911. And I finally got there. That's an accomplishment item. Or 
this knife my dad gave me when I turned 13, like it's not even sharp anymore. It doesn't even open anymore, but man, that's a relationship moment. So that's what was really interesting about it. But again, it gives you a tool to build the future you want. It was funny when I was going through this myself, just prepping for this interview, I've always thought, cause I travel a lot. I love to travel. I thought, okay, experience is going to be all over mine. Yeah. Experiences were fine. It was relationships that were number one. And I thought about the most fun I have when I travel is meeting new people. And what's funny is, I mean, I'm actually an introvert disguised as an extrovert because I do this stuff, but it was the relationships on the travel, John. It's like this, aha. Yeah, that's the thing that's fun. I always say it's the most honest personality test ever created because the joke I say is I've lied on every personality test. I totally because do. No, I won't steal pencils. I promise I won't steal pencils. Yeah, well, they go, hey, here's the thing an honest person does. Do you do that? And you're like, right. I sure do. <laughs> like, you know what they want you to say. They're like, do you ever punch people in the face? You're like, never, never. do, you know? And so like, I always put a degree of should into it. This one's not, it's just the things you care about. And it's really who you are. And then you do the categories after and that's what goes, oh, okay. I didn't like for me, I would have told you before the list, man, I love skiing with friends. I love skiing with friends. Skiing was on there three times. And every time I was by myself and I was like, oh, okay. I like some introverted time and I love my friends, but the best day I had was in Utah by myself. And that felt really refreshing. Like, oh, okay. So that was very eye opening for me. Maybe cross country skiing in the woods is more for you. Never, never. No? Once they invented downhill, forget it, dude. Forget <laughs> it. Like that should have been the day cross country ended, in my opinion. <laughs> Who wants to ski uphill? I don't want to work while I ski. No, Come no, on. I want to enjoy it. This project is uh, such like everything you do. It's if everybody looks left, John A. Cuff's going to look right. It's called All It Takes is a Goal, the three step plan to ditch regret and tap into your massive potential. We began the journey here. If you want more of it, the book's available everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. You can get it at johnacuff.com. I read the audiobook. So if you're an audio person, you're listening to this. There's 10 bonus stories in the audiobook. And then I teach a goal community called the Guaranteed Goals Community at johnacuff.com slash goals. Awesome. And we'll link to that on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. John, I got two more things I just got to say to you Let's because normally- Normally, when I thank uh, guests, you know, that's the end of the interview. But I got to tell you here with all our stacker community here, every time you come back, I think this is your third time on Stacking Benjamins. Karen, our wonderful producer, said that when she saw you live with Finish, she said it changed Mm -hmm. her relationships. It changed her view of the world. Like we get excited about all the mentors we have here. I just want to tell you how much gratitude we have for you, my friend. And then Stacy, who just started working with us a month ago. Said she read Quitter and uh, it made her look at work differently. Like all of a sudden she's like, oh, I don't have to do the crap everybody else does. So John, we are very thankful for you here in mom's basement, my friend. Oh man, I appreciate that. That's really encouraging. This is Aaron from Colorado Springs. And when I'm not teaching three boys how to patch hockey stick holes in drywall, I'm stacking Benjamins. Huge thanks again to John for mentoring us. I love the idea of looking back versus looking forward. You know, look at what has lit you up in the past and that will give you a key. More of that, right? Tequila! There's a, yes. <laughs> there's, a, there's a woman Ripple. in Australia we're going to have- Is something else we were supposed to be thinking about? On the show. She has this fantastic metric she calls the to gold ratio. If we want less <gasps> we want more gold. So look back at the stuff that was gold, the stuff that was And you know what? Change that up. And I just said that over and over so Steve could bleep all that. So You said a swear. uh, Hey, let's throw out the lifeline, guys. And we're going to help a stacker get better with their money. If you've got a question that you'd like OG to answer, head to stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail. And uh, we're sure to come to your aid very, very quickly right now. It seems like this time of year, generally over the holidays, people thinking about other stuff, the queue gets shorter and you get closer to a front row seat. Then we get around closer to summertime and it might take us a few months to get to you. But right now with that line is fairly short, stackybenjamins.com slash voicemail. Today we are going to help out stacker Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Joe and OG, this is Aaron in Seattle. I happen to know from listening to this show that spouses can't contribute to an FSA and an HSA in the same year. I happen to mention this in passing to a coworker during open enrollment, and he went, oh, crud. I was talking to him yesterday, and neither he nor his wife could get anyone at HR to talk to them during open enrollment. So now they're set 
to contribute to an FSA and an HSA both next year. What do they do? Thanks for taking the question. And you know what? I like a size triple XL because I want to swim in my shirt. Thanks. <laughs> wow. Aaron, there in Seattle, there's a lot. Is, is there water in Seattle? I think there might be some water in Seattle. Nice balmy, warm seawater there in Seattle. Mm, nice. Swim over to Bainbridge Island. Yeah, I feel like this was a asking for a friend type question. Like this couldn't have been her, couldn't have her been. husband that I we're both never con- done that. contributing. No. How does never. my, let's say I have this friend. OG, <laughs> FSA, HSA, dilemma. What do we do? This is a, an interesting question. Aaron, because most of the time, your company benefits election program, if you will, simply won't allow you to do it. <laughs> like, you know, when you go to put in, I want this health insurance, it will not allow you to say, I want this health insurance, which is tied to an HSA, high deductible plan, and then also allow you to select the FSA on your payroll because that's, you know, pre tax contributions or, you know, pre tax savings as well. Maybe this is a spousal thing where one spouse picked one thing, one spouse picked another, they didn't communicate very well or got whatever confused. In any case, this is kind of a mess. You can't have an HSA pay for the same expenses and during the same period as an FSA as it relates to medical expenses. That's what an FSA is for and an HSA is for also is for out-of-pocket healthcare expenses. An HSA has no annual limitation in terms of spending, whereas an FSA, you it's use it or lose it. You have to consume all of the FSA money by the end of the year or you know whatever that period of time is to submit for reimbursements after the end of the year. So you have to be aware of that. But there is a provision for FSAs to be considered limited purpose, which means that you can't use the FSA for medical expenses incurred while you were also eligible for the HSA and also using that. So kind of a mess. I don't know how to officially tell anybody that this is a limited purpose FSA. If there's a form to fill out or or something along those lines, I suspect that it might all get reconciled on your tax return in 2025 when you file for the 2024 tax year. And you might have to check a few boxes on your tax return or have a CPA kind of help you walk through that. But in both cases, if you're contributing to the FSA, you have to make sure that you consume all of those dollars by the end of December 2024. Otherwise, they go bye-bye. Maybe there's some chance that this is a dependent care FSA, which is a completely different thing. And it's to be used for like preschool expenses, daycare expenses, that sort of thing. That's up to 5K. So maybe that's it. And that's that's different than a HSA. So maybe it's a dependent care FSA. But anyways... Go get those teeth cleaned. If it is a regular FSA, get them cleaned every other every other week because teeth cleanings are like 150 bucks, and you're gonna you got like five grand FSA money if you maxed it out. So, so many dental procedures you possibly have. Go a lot. Prepay a lot. Just be like, can I give you all of my teeth cleanings from now until 30 out seven? And can I take all the suckers on the counter on the way out? Best wishes. Yeah. Good luck. Let Aaron. us know how it goes. Yeah. Please do because I'm, we want to make sure we keep other people out of that situation. And uh, you know what? We will send you a code and you can make that t-shirt as absolutely big for swimming as you want it. Uh, Stackingbenjamins.com slash voicemail is where you go to ask a question like Aaron did and to get help in an area that in this case, man, very, very difficult. All right. That's going to do it for today, except for our back porch If your goal isn't just to have one question answered, but you need lots of question answered, in other words, lots of question answered, lots of question be answered, I think is the correct phrase there, Joe. Uh, You know what? You may be looking for better financial help in your corner. OG and his team taking on seven clients this first quarter. So don't walk. Run. Yeah, run, don't walk. If you're you're the seventh caller, (laughs) you will win a free date with OG's team to talk about your money management. Stackingbenjamins.com slash OG gets you to OG and his team's calendar to get going on better financial goals. 
I don't think that was quite the polished, sophisticated promo that he had in mind. <laughs> That's why I do a podcast about money, and I'm not a pitch man for KTEL, probably, right there. You are not. We've got uh, so much fun stuff happening, Doug. I know that um, we've had some of our, speaking of Erin and her swag, we've had some swag out in the wild. Yeah. We have, and we've been asking about this for a while, and it's so glad. I'm so glad. It's so glad that I'm. I'd great. be so glad. I'm, yeah, I'd be gladdening. There's happiness emanating from me because we've had a several uh, great stackers have posted in the basement. We had Adam uh, who posted a great shot of him rocking his recently procured. SB Lifeline shirt today. The great thing that Adam did was he didn't tell his family that he had called in. So he like had the family listen to the episode. And when they heard his name called, apparently they went crazy. It's a celebrity. Mayhem. Of course. Food was getting thrown around the kitchen. It was Couldn't incredible. It. Yeah. And uh, so we had fun with that. And then um, this is something I still don't understand. Adam posted a picture of himself in his t shirt in front of his Cleveland shrine. He has a shrine to Cleveland. Did, did Cleveland die? Did we not know it? Grover? Grover Cleveland? <laughs> right. But that was very cool. Thanks for that. And then this was awesome. Remember back in early December, our writer, Le- writer? <laughs> our writer, our writer, Lisa, our writer, or writer, Lisa Curry. Uh, yeah, our writer, Lisa Curry, uh, filmed a special, a stand up comedy special in Madison, Wisconsin. And I challenged stackers within a six state radius and Janelle answered the call. She went there. That was not only did she, yeah, she posted a picture of herself in front of Lisa's uh, promo picture in the lobby. But then, and this is my favorite part. She called me out to say, Doug, where the heck are you now? I I tried, I really tried Janelle to get there, but I got waylaid at the bar and then the lineys just kept on getting poured. And at next the thing union, I know at the union there along the lake, I missed it. And, uh, I, I had every intention to go, but those lineys go down smooth. So that was great that we had a couple of stackers post and we've had others. Um, but, uh, those were two recent ones that we, we really liked, you know, Joe moving off of t-shirts. I want to talk about the great Instagram lives that we've really been stepping up lately. We've been doing a lot more of those and bringing some great guests. Thanks, man. A stacker, Colin, is recognizing how great those Instagrams are. He says, thanks, Joe Salcihai and Kate Yunkin and the team for doing the live Instagram interviews. I was just reflecting on what a unique opportunity we are given to ask these great guests questions. For example, where else can you go to ask the founder of one of the leading budget apps your questions about why you should join their platform? Pretty cool. And he's right. We, you know, we, uh, because of our access uh, to great guests within this community, we bring those to our stackers and you can talk right to them. I would not be surprised if we're about to get Nobel Prize winners and, and we've uh, had them on here. We've had them on the podcast. Yeah. So could be next over there. You know what I like? You know what I like though to, to respond to Colin? Thank you for the kind words. But it truly is the questions that you guys bring and ask that make that. I mean, you know, we could just have them on the podcast, like the brilliant John Acuff today. And I get to ask John all my questions, but being able to bring people on an Instagram where you get to ask your questions, it's the fact that you guys show up and ask the questions that let us keep doing it. If you wouldn't have shown up for those, we wouldn't have expanded it to be twice a week instead of once. So yeah, but we had a great week just before the last week of the year break, Yanali Espinal, who's just an amazing guest talking about her end of the year stuff. And then, of course, uh, we talked to the founder, uh, Val, from Monarch Money about how the app works. And we had we had a ton of people asking Val all kinds of questions about how that app actually works. Fantastic stuff. So thanks, Colin, to you. I've got something for you, Doug. And actually, and for you, OG, this is a little something that I heard that, that might have hit a little close to home. So I'm going to take a little umbrage maybe with this. Uh, this was a Facebook reel that I heard recently. Listen to this. People don't know this, but sleep is bad for you. Did you read that somewhere? I don't read. It lowers your testosterone. Really? Podcast, Put the mic down! Put the mic down! Don't even think about it! 
This episode is over, fellas. We're the podcast police. We're a task force that stops white guys from starting podcasts for no reason. Anything you say can and will be used against you. Subscribe to the Patreon. All right, enough. It's become a real problem here in Los Angeles. These guys reuse mics, share mics, podcast in the morning, podcast at night. Hell, half the time, they don't realize the mic's not even plugged in. Poor guy doesn't even have a co-host. Mike's down! Mike's down, Glenn! Just missed him. Mike's still hot. Jesus. Every year, we lose about half our recruits. Do they die? No. We're losing the podcast. Class of 2015? Lost a lot of good men. Just busted a 17-year-old for podcasting. Already on the mic. What life advice could you possibly be sharing? Hey! Get back here! Parents call. I had no idea my son was podcasting. You had no idea? Your son's 11! He's asking for a goddamn cold plug! All right, man, what do you need? I got mics. I got whatever podcasting equipment you need. Uh, you know what? I need uh, for you to get on go, the go, ground! Go, go, go! Get down! Get down! Suspect apprehended! Somebody. Suspect apprehended! This is personal to me because... I lost my brother to podcasting. He was top of his class. Then one day he says to me, we have such funny conversations. Why don't we start recording now? From that point on, he was so You got to follow the money. All this is funded by big sponsors. You got Roman, BetterHelp, Athletic Greens. Those guys go under this whole nightmare. Right? You know, I, not not for I, nothing, I, but can we reach out to Roman and Hims? I hear they're good products. That's I'd be helpful. That was great. Our friend uh, David Hooper who has a, a show about podcasting, a podcast about podcasting, found that. So thanks to thanks to Dave Hooper for sure. To make it this. clear, we were here before it was cool. We, we were here as middle-aged white guys before it was as cool. As way cool as it is now, we're even cooler. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Just to be clear. Yeah. And kids, stay away from podcasting. We can tell you firsthand <laughs> what it does. All right. That's going to do it for today. Coming up on Friday, you guessed it. Led Penzo brings his Walmart purchased magic eight ball. And we are going to find out how the eight ball did last year. We're going to uh, dig into some, our pro predictions. Jeffrey Gundelach had his today. We'll have ours on Friday. But before that, Doug, everybody take your paper out. Ready? Paper and a pen, because Doug's about to give you the top three to do's from today's show. Here's your to-do list from everything we talked about on this episode. First, take some advice from John Acuff. Struggling with goals and long-term purpose discussions? Look backward at what lights your fire, not forward into the void. Use that list to light up your life more, and you're going to have goals that inspire you much more than scare you. Second, predicting the future with your investments? Not a great idea. How about hitting pause on your trading slash betting and instead make an investment policy statement? That'll serve you far better than trying to look in your crystal ball. But the big lesson, I have only one goal, John Acuff, not to be the guy who changes over Joe's mom's laundry. How do I make that a thing in 2024? AOG, I got a trade idea for you, buddy. Maybe I'll start washing mom's car and you... Oh, wait, that's worse. Never mind. I'm good. I got it. I'm good. Thanks to John Acuff for joining us today. You can find out more about his work at johnacuff.com. And you can find his latest book, All It Takes is a Goal, wherever books are sold. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2024, and is created by Joe Saul Cihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Lisa Curry, who's also the host of the Long Story Long podcast, with help from me, Joe, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at The 201. Just visit stackingbenjamins.com slash 201 wonder how beautiful we all are of course you'll never know if you don't check out our youtube version of the show engineered by tina eichenberg then you'll see once and for all that i'm the best thing going for this podcast once we bottle up all this goodness we ship it to our engineer the amazing steve stewart steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as i do right now want to chat with friends about the show later Mom's friend Gertrude, Stacy Doe, and Julia Garib are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. 
For more interactive fun, join us in Instagram every Tuesday and Thursday for our Instagram Lives. Kate Yonkin and Joe host these weekly. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. The Rolling Stone Music Now podcast gets inside the biggest stories with Rolling Stone senior writer Brian Hyatt, joined by Bob Harvia from 60 Songs to Explain the 90s. There's no freedom rock yet of the 90s. You it's know, coming, and, and, though, <laughs> from 2010 to 2019. And the top 10 is Nirvana, <laughs> Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam. So the freedom rock right. of the 90s is the grunge Mount Rushmore. Rolling Stone Music Now, wherever you listen.